Our reading is from Matthew chapter 3 verses 1 and 2 and 5 and 6 and then chapter 3 verses 11 to 17. At that time, John the Baptist came to the desert of Judea and started preaching. Turn away from your sins, he said, because the kingdom of heaven is near. People came to him from Jerusalem, from the whole province of Judea, and from all the country near the river Jordan. They confessed their sins, and he baptized them in the Jordan. I baptize you with water to show that you have repented. But the one who will come after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He is much greater than I am, and I am not good enough even to carry his sandals. He has his winnowing shovel with him to thresh out all the grain. He will gather his wheat into his barn, but he will burn the chaff in a fire that never goes out. At that time, Jesus arrived from Galilee and came to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. But John tried to make him change his mind. I ought to be baptized by you, John said, and yet you have come to me. But Jesus answered him, Let it be so for now, for in this way we shall do all that God requires. So John agreed. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. Then heaven was opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God coming down like a dove and alighting on him. Then a voice said from heaven, This is my own dear Son, with whom I am pleased. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. Today's Pentecost message will be shared in two parts. This first part is entitled, Baptism of Jesus. Thanks to Gospel writer Matthew, we find ourselves in a surprising setting, given this is Pentecost. Not as you would imagine among Jerusalem's crowds, but for now at least, stepping back in time some three years earlier, to be among those drawn by the preaching of John, known as the baptizer. Drawn to the territory of the River Jordan by this man, whom we are told, was filled with the Holy Spirit since birth. Here marks the end of Jesus' 30 years of private life. Here, the Spirit descends to equip him for his very public future life and ministry. Here, God the Father's words of acceptance and approval are voiced. John, reluctant to baptize Jesus, does so only to accomplish God's purpose, while Jesus submits and receives baptism by John to do the same. Jesus, the only one who has no confession to make, is drenched in the very same waters where people have confessed their sins. Symbolically immersed, he identifies himself with all people. Then rising from beneath the waters, a metaphor for his own death. Both he and John witnessed God and the Spirit's presence, visible, audible, each echoing the Hebrew scriptures. Take the Father's own personal words, a a melding of Psalm 2 verse 7 and Isaiah 42 verse 1 that we began with. This is my own dear Son, with whom I am pleased. Similar words will be spoken later at Jesus' transfiguration. This is my own dear Son, whom I have chosen, and with whom I am pleased. Listen to him. And while all gospel writers describe the spirit being like a dove, reminiscent of God's presence hovering over the waters of creation, Luke alone implies that heavens open and the spirit alights in response to Jesus praying. What can we learn? The same spirit there at the genesis of creation and present at baptism will now remain Jesus' constant companion, 
According to Luke, there throughout his immediate temptation, Jesus returned from the Jordan full of the Holy Spirit and was led by the Spirit into the desert where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. There, at the outset of his public ministry, Jesus returned to Galilee and the power of the Holy Spirit was with him. He taught in the synagogues and was praised by everyone. Well, the praise by everyone thing was short-lived. <laughs> there, as Jesus now returns to where he was brought up in Nazareth, now attends, as usual, on the Sabbath, the local synagogue, the place of worship where a leader would stand to pray and read the scrolls of scripture, but sit to teach. Where anyone might be invited to take part in the service of prayers, readings and sermon. There, as Jesus himself stands to read the scriptures and is handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, unrolling the scroll, he reads the first two verses of chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has chosen me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed and announce that the time has come when the Lord will save his people. Rolling up the scroll and handing it back to the attendant, Jesus sits. And as the people expectantly wait to hear his teaching, he informs them this passage of scripture has come true today as you heard it being read. <laughs> Imagine that. These few instances demonstrate the diverse nature of God's Holy Spirit already at work within Jesus' life as a helper, comforting and sustaining him through difficulty as a teacher imparting knowledge and giving guidance, as an interpreter bringing inspiration and discernment. It was Jesus who would explain to his first disciples during their final meal together, I will ask a father and he will give you another helper who will stay with you forever. He is the Spirit who reveals the truth about God. The world cannot receive him or know him because it cannot see him or know him. But you know him because he remains with you and will be in you. This same Spirit's presence, soon to be poured out upon all believers, is foretold by John the Baptist himself. He who contrasts the elements of water, his own form of baptism, with Messiah's greater baptism by the Holy Spirit and fire, highlighting both a purifying and consuming aspect of the Spirit's work. This emphasis is perhaps less surprising when we realize John may well have shared a common belief that the last judgment would be enacted by people immersing themselves in and crossing a river of fire. No doubt inspired by the same God who called Israel out of Egypt to cross the Jordan, he now creates a new people by symbolically passing them through the waters of baptism in the same river. Uniquely instituted by John, this simple act of immersion of having one's old life washed away and rising as if newborn, unlike circumcision, made salvation available to everyone. This was enough to gain forgiveness in the face of God's coming judgment and kingdom recognized by some as now being at hand through the arrival of Messiah the very one whom John the Baptist identified as Jesus, the man he called the Son of God and the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world.
We hear now our second readings. They're from John 20 verses 19 to 23 and also Acts 2 verses 1 to 4. <clears throat> Jesus appears to his disciples. It was late that Sunday evening and the disciples were gathered together behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities. Then Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said. After saying this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were filled with joy at seeing the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. The coming of the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost came, all the believers were gathered together in one place. Suddenly there was a noise from the sky which sounded like a strong wind blowing and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they saw what looked like tongues of fire which spread out and touched each person there. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to talk in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. We continue with our second part of today's message, Baptism of the Holy Spirit. From John's Gospel, in the wake of Jesus' cruel suffering and death, in the midst of the disciples' disillusionment, uncertainty, grief and fear, they gather together privately behind closed doors. Here, the risen Lord comes among them, restoring faith, bringing joy, speaking peace, commissioning them and imparting to them the reception of the Holy Spirit in much the same way as the Creator first breathed God's life-giving breath into Adam. Emphasis here rests upon the intimate, gentle means by which the Spirit is given and received, is breathed in. From Luke's Book of Acts In the wake of Jesus' ascension, his return to the Father in heaven, and the disciples' joyous outpouring of thanksgiving in the temple, in the midst of their now prayerful, expectant waiting, in obedience to the risen Lord's own request, they gather together publicly in Jerusalem. Here, the Holy Spirit comes upon them, moves among them, audibly as a mighty rushing wind, visibly as tongues of fire, filling and empowering them for service by setting them ablaze for God causing an outpouring of praise, this time in other languages, as the Spirit enables them to speak. Emphasis here is upon the perceptible dynamic means by which the Spirit is received and expressed, is breathed out. What can we learn? First, each experience and demonstration of the Spirit's presence is no less valid than the next. And this becomes increasingly evident as we continue reading the Acts of the Apostles. Take chapter 10. Peter's still speaking God's message when the Spirit falls upon his Gentile hearers, much to the amazement of Peter's own Jewish traveling companions. And after these new believers respond by themselves, praising God's greatness in other languages, they are baptized in Jesus' name. In the very next chapter, Acts 11, explaining to his hearers in Jerusalem, Peter then reiterates, 
I remembered what the Lord himself had said. John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. It is clear God gave these Gentiles the same gift he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus and adds, who was I then to stop God? And later, it's Paul who finds himself in Ephesus, encountering other disciples who've never even heard of the Holy Spirit and who've only received John's baptism. So Paul explains to them, the baptism of John was for those who turned from their sins. For John told the people of Israel to believe in the one who was coming after him, that is, in Jesus. Accepting and believing Paul's statement, in faith they are now baptized in Jesus' name. Paul then places his hands on them. The Holy Spirit comes upon them and they too begin speaking in other tongues, proclaiming God's message with joy. These instances reveal the Holy Spirit comes to people in a variety of different ways. So who are we to limit God's activity by prescribing the where, the when, the how? Who are we then to try and stop God? <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> Second, there is an ongoing rhythm to life, a breathing in and breathing out. Each is vital to live. So it is with the Spirit. In John's Gospel, Jesus explains to Nicodemus and us alike, this word, Spirit, signifying wind, breath and power, blows wherever it wishes. He also reminds us that to see the kingdom of God, one must be born again, born of water and the Spirit. Whenever we welcome Jesus into our lives, we also receive or breathe in the Holy Spirit. We are born again. But little good comes of holding one's breath. To continue sustaining ourselves and be of any use to others, this breath of life must be let out. As a song goes, freely, freely you have received. Freely, freely give. Third, baptism in the Holy Spirit is a life changing event. This should come as no surprise. When we learn the word baptize means to completely suffuse, to drench, saturate or flood our entire being, leaving us in classical Greek with the image of a, a totally submerged waterlogged ship. Again, when we accept Jesus into our lives, God's love is poured into our hearts by means of the Holy Spirit, who is God's gift to us, fact. But a fresh outpouring or infilling of the same Spirit is, is still needed to renew and empower us before overflowing to refresh the world and those around us. As Jesus, quoting the prophets Ezekiel and Zechariah, said about the Spirit in John 7, 38, Whoever believes in me, streams of, of life-giving water will pour out from his heart. Whatever we might think, whatever we may or may not have personally experienced, at the end of the day, what should come from any touch of God upon someone's life is good. Change for the better, a new sense of acceptance, purpose, outlook, signs of transformation and growth. For privately, publicly, the Holy Spirit brings far more than a passing experience, which we should never seek in and of itself. As 
Seeds are sown, gifts imparted, which, given time, prayer and nurturing, will begin to grow and are to be put to good use. The results of this internal change will eventually be encountered by others, outworked through our physical bodies, our speech, our actions. For this is the way we continue to come into contact with our environment and those around us. For many, it is unlikely they will be helped or challenged until they come to see, hear and experience in person Jesus' life flowing from us. In drawing today's Pentecost message to a close, I share Paul's words, no less relevant as we mark Pentecost in this day and age, than they were to his first hearers some 2,000 years ago. Pointing out the obvious, he states in 1 Corinthians 12, There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit gives them. There are different ways of serving, but the same God is served. There are different abilities to perform service, but the same God gives ability to everyone for their particular service. The Spirit's presence is shown in some way in each person for the good of all. And ends by repeating, it is one and the same Spirit who does all this. I pray that we may so welcome God's Holy Spirit that streams of life-giving water will overflow from us into the lives of others in such a way that they too might come to praise our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ Amen.